Saturday, January 1st, 1944. Another new year has begun and we're in the middle of the great terror known as winter. We've been here one year, five months, and 25 days. We're all thinner, paler, and a lot hungrier. We've been plagued by medical problems. Everyone's always suffering from something. And although we can't call a doctor, our favorite dentist is never too far away. Ow! Just hold on a moment. Finish. Right. How can I? You're killing me. Maybe if you'd stop complaining, I'd finish sooner. All right, all right. I'll try. Ow! Look, careful, you've got your instrument stuck in your tooth. Is that my fault? Pull it out! You're making it go any further. I'm lucky. I've been healthy. In fact, I've been growing. So much I can't fit into my shoes anymore, not to speak of anything else. And there's another change, something happening inside me. I read somewhere that girls of my age don't feel quite certain of themselves, that they become quiet within and begin to think of the miracle that is taking place in their bodies. I think that what has happened to me is so wonderful. Not only what can be seen, but what is taking place inside. Each time it has happened, I have a feeling that I have a sweet secret. And in spite of my pain, I long for the time when I shall feel that secret within me again. And there's something else. Peter. Whenever he looks at me with those eyes, I get this feeling. and slipper on the black market these days. Look, they match. Incredible. Say fit? Mm-hmm. All grown up. <laughs> oh, Ready for Hollywood. <laughs> Enjoy them, Anna. Don't worry, I'll be back to give you a full report tomorrow. Wait, me. There's something I want you to do for me. What? What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. What is it? He wants to sell the fur coat. No, don't do this to me, buddy. This is my coat. 
I've had this coat for 17 years. My father gave me this coat. Let go. You have to let this go. <laughs> Don't you dare. Let go. Uh, how can you hold on to a fur coat when people are in such desperate need of warm clothing? <laughs> let go of it, please. Besides, we're running out of money. We've been running out of money for months. You have to give it up. Going too fast. We je say. Je say. I know that one. Bon, continue on. A prochain page, s'il vous plaît. I just don't understand. I would never, never have done anything like that to you. That coat was 17 years old, for God's sake. Those skins had definitely seen their day. That's not the point, and you know it. I know that we need money. Why can't you get that through your head? Don't talk to her like that. You never understood. Here we go with this. That coat was the last thing. A whole world gone. Well, you still have us, don't you? You took the last memory of my father away. Yeah, do we have to hear about your father again? If it weren't for your father, the coat, our apartment with all our possessions, we'd be in America by now. Oh, please. It's your fault. Oh, please, it was you too, you know. You didn't want to go. I only stayed because of you. Believe me, I knew which way the wind was blowing. Oh, sure, you always know everything. Mother, please, stop. Your mother will never listen. I could just say one thing. No, you cannot. You say too much already, and it's not your business anyway. You shouldn't have said that, Mother. What? You've hurt her feelings. Oh. Well, I apologize, all right. I apologize to everyone. Sorry for what happened in there. I wish I could have said something. But they make me feel so. I can't stand it when they. Sometimes I wish, wish I didn't belong to them at all. I just hope I never come out like them. You won't. I know it. Like him. What if I'm like him? You're not. Believe me. All I can say is. I don't know. What I mean is, you're always a big help to me. I am? How? When you're cheerful, it, well, keeps me from feeling depressed. I'm not always so cheerful, you know. Inside. Really? It's hard. If you want to cry or something, there's nowhere to go. Fight, you know, with my parents. I just stuck into my room. 
talk to your parents. Not really. I never discuss anything serious with my mother. She just doesn't understand. I can talk about everything with father. Except mother. I don't think you can really, really be intimate with someone if they're holding something back. Do you? I think your father's terrific. He likes you too. Do you think so? I can tell from the little things he says. It's funny, isn't it? What? Well, we've lived here for almost a year and a half, and, well, this is the first time we've really talked. I know what you mean. is shining, the sky a deep blue. There's a magnificent breeze, and I'm longing, so longing, for everything. I walk from room to room, breathe through the crack in the window frame, feel my heart beating as if to say, can't you fulfill this longing at last? I long for every boy. And to Peter, I want to shout, say something, don't just smile all the time, touch me, so I can get that delicious feeling inside. I feel spring within me. I feel spring awakening. I feel it in my entire body and soul. I'm utterly confused. Don't know what to read, to write, to do. I only know I am longing. March 29th, 1944. We've had to cut down even further on food. The rats have gobbled up some of our precious supplies. They must be desperate too. Our mouths are watering for anything edible. All we've had to eat this week is pickled kale and rotten potatoes. You won't believe how much kale can stink when it's a few years old. What is it tonight, Petronella? Don't ask. I have to know. I have to be prepared. On top of it all, every meal there's been a political discussion ending in some terrible fight. But last night, something even more terrible happened. God, not this again! Something wrong, Mr. Dussel. Why don't you try cooking for a change, instead of insulting my wife? Well, I think you prepared the kale very well, Mrs. Von Don. No. I don't know how you do it. Mr. Frunk, always the soul of politeness. Every night, another mirror. Be careful, Mr. Dussel. We don't want to clog the pipes like last week. Oh, please. What's wrong, Margo? You're not eating. Eat. You have to eat. I'm not hungry. Well, if she doesn't want it, Peter will eat it. No. I can't. I just can't. Margo, just take a bite. She eats like a bird. Look at her every day a smaller bird. Margo, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm sorry, Mrs. Von Gaunt. Anna's eating. Peter's eating. How do you do it, Anna? Pretend it's delicious. Don't look at it, and before I know it, it's gone. Very wise, though. I eat because I'm hungry. <laughs> Margo, you've got to force yourself. You're too thin. She's not the only one. We're all famished. When will this war be over? 
This war would be over a lot sooner if the damn British would finally start the invasion. Please, not tonight. The British are fighting for their lives. They'll do something when the time's right. When we're all dead and buried, you mean? It's amazing how strong those Germans are. It's amazing. Those Germans are so strong, they're going to win the war. Is that what you mean? They might. They very well might. If the British don't get moving. They're moving, for God's sake. Isn't 3,000 tons of bombs on Hamburg last Saturday enough for you? No. Well, then how many bombs do you need? Enough so we don't have to worry about going to Poland. Oh. Too, but thought I might know something more. I paid no attention. But today, signing some invoices, he brought it to the office. I looked up and saw him staring at the bookcase. Oh my god. He said he thought I remembered a door being there. Then he said he wanted more money. Ten more guilders a month. Blackmail? Ten guilders? Very modest blackmail. It's just the beginning. Well, what did you tell him? I said I had to think about it. Should I pay him the money? Take a chance on firing him? For God's or? sake, pay him the money! Offer him half. We'll find out if the black man. Look, maybe he knows nothing, but it's getting more dangerous every day out there. No one can be trusted. He must be more quiet. More quiet. I'll offer him half. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. We'll hope for the best. Thank you. Mother, please. I can't bear it seeing you like this. I'll be all right in a moment, Anika. Please, go back to supper. And now, a message from the Dutch Minister of Education. History cannot be written on the basis of official documents alone. If our descendants are to understand what we as a nation have endured through these years, we need simple everyday pieces, a diary, or letters from a forced laborer in Germany. At the end of such a terrible evening, something wonderful happened, something amazing. Mr. Bolkenstein, our cabinet minister, speaking on the Dutch broadcast from London, said that a collection of diaries and letters would be made after the war. Just imagine how interesting it would be if I were to publish a novel called The Secret Annex. It could be based on my diary. I'll start revising it tomorrow. Unless you write yourself, you can't know how wonderful it is. When I write, I shake off all my cares. But I want to achieve more than that. I want to be useful and bring enjoyment to all people, even those I've never met. I want to go on living even after my death. Mr. Dussel is getting awfully impatient out there. Let him. I'm always waiting for him. Are you going up to the attic with Peter again? I've already been up there today. I went up exactly twice. Wants to practice French together and wants to get to and wants to get the potatoes for supper. But you know Mrs. Von Don. She's got comments for everything. She can't help herself. She's in nature. Besides, I don't think it's Mrs. Von Don that's upsetting you. I'm not upset. You're not jealous? Of Peter and me? <laughs> I'd be insanely jealous if it were you instead of me. I'm sure you would be. But I'm not. Aren't you, Margo? Tell the truth. Who wouldn't want someone to have deep, serious conversations with? And who knows what else? Yes, I'm jealous. Not of you and Peter. Just wish I had someone of my own. Someone to talk to. You mean it? Yes, I mean it. I want you to have a good time tonight, and every night. I've already missed out on so much here. Oh, Margo, you're such a generous person. Besides, 
Maybe there's nothing to be jealous of. We don't do anything. I mean, he hasn't even kissed me. The kiss will come. I'm not sure if I want it to. Oh, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. It's in your nature. your hair. I can finally get back into my room. Our room, dear Mr. Dussel. And yes, you may. Thank you so much. Anna, again. Again. Look at her. It's cold in the attic. You better bundle up. In my day, it was the boys who called on the girls. Uh, young people like to feel they have secrets. They need a place to talk. Talk? Not what they called it in my day. I think true love maybe something in our little annex. If we're in here much longer, we may even have a little annex wedding. <laughs> Frankly, I can't stand another moment of this stupid chatter. Oh, now don't forget to be down by nine. Maybe just a little. Here.
You won't let them stop you from coming out here again, will you? No, I promise. Maybe I'll bring one of my stories and read it to you sometime. Then you'll come tomorrow night? If you want me to. I do. 905. All Jews must be out of the German-occupied countries before July 1st. The province of Utrecht will be cleansed of Jews between April 1st and May 1st, and the provinces of North and South Holland immediately thereafter. Immediately thereafter. Immediately thereafter. Immediately thereafter. Immediately thereafter. trying to say, but it would be impossible for them to go anywhere they at all. They have to! I can't take it with them here. Edith, you know how you've been in these past That has nothing to do with it! No. We're all under terrible strain. It won't happen again? No. Never. I promise. I want them to leave. You'd put us out on the street. There are other hiding places. Maybe we'll find something. Don't worry about the money. I'll find the money. Mr. Frump, you told my husband you would never forget what he did to you when you first came to Amsterdam. If my husband had any obligation to you, it's paid for. If I've never seen you like this, for God's sake. You can't throw Peter out. Peter hasn't done anything. Peter can stay. I wouldn't feel right without Father. Father, please, they'd be killed on the street. Anna's right. You can't send them away. Stay until me finds him something. But we're switching rooms. I don't want him near the food. Let's divide it up now. What? Mr. Dussel, no. we are not going to divide up some rotten potatoes. Margo, Mr. Dussel, everyone back to your room. Mr. Dussel. Mr. Frank, Mrs. Mr. Frank, Mr. Margo, Stop Anna, it, Mr. Mr. Condon, Mr. 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 I beg you, Mr. please. Mr. The 
the British? British, Americans, everyone. Nearly 4,000 ships. Every year we fought for this moment. Look, I brought a map. Let's see. Um, Cherbourg, the first city. They're fighting for it now. Uh, how many days till we get from Normandy to the Netherlands? What did I tell you? What did I tell you? <laughs> Cherbourg, come. Pull the back, Paris, and then Amsterdam. <laughs> Buddy. <laughs> Harvey, didn't you hear? We're going to be free soon. People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe, made in conjunction with our great Russian allies. Just as I was falling asleep, my friend Hanalee suddenly appeared before me, dressed in rags, her face thin and worn. She looked at me with such sadness in her enormous eyes that I could read the message in them. Oh, Anna, why have you deserted me? Help me, help me, rescue me from this hell. If only I could. Why have I been chosen to live and she to die? Oh, Hanalee, Hanalee, if only I could take you away share everything I have with you. I hope if you live to the end of the war and return to us, I'll be able to take you in. Are you still alive? I keep seeing your enormous eyes. I keep seeing myself in your place. You're a reminder of what my fate might have been. What will we do if we're ever... No, I mustn't write that down. But the question won't let itself be pushed to the back of my mind. All the fear I've ever felt is looming before me in total, absolute horror.
And so we come to the end of this broadcast from BBC Radio Europe. Till tomorrow, listeners, and we all know, no matter how hard the times and how heavy the separation, we are once more a day closer to the liberation. Jam with those three up there. Oh, Mr. Deuce, you're such a warrior. Let the children enjoy themselves. God, these are good. I'll tell you a secret. Every night, I think they're coming. They're coming. Our liberators. I bet you'll both forget all about me once you're back with all your old friends again. All our friends are gone, Peter. But we won't forget you, ever. Well, I'll tell you one thing. When we're out of here, It's a wonder I haven't abandoned all my ideals. They seem so absurd and impractical, yet I cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are really good at heart. for me to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering, and death. I see the world slowly being transformed into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder, which will destroy us too. I feel the suffering of millions. Bork, a barren heath, wooden towers where our jailers stand guard, walls covered with thousands of flies. The eight of us crammed into prison barrack 67, betrayed. We never know by whom. Our last month together. Mata and Peter walking hand in hand between the barracks and barbed wire. Edith, worrying about the children, washing underclothing in murky water. No. 
Margo silent and staring at nothing. Our last days on Dutch soil. Late August, Paris freed. Brussels, Antwerp. But for us, it is too late. Tuesday, September 3rd, a thousand of us herded into cattle cars, the last transport to leave Vesterborg for the extermination camps. The train. Three days, three nights. On the third night, Auschwitz. Separation. Men from women. Edith, Margot, Anna. My family, never again. Selection. Half our transport killed in the gas chambers. One day, Peter and I see a group of men march away. His father among them. Gassed. Peter on the death march to Mount Thousand, dead three days before the British arrived. His mother, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, Buchenwald, Freisienstadt, date of death unknown. Mr. Dussel dies in the night gallery. January 27th, I am free from Auschwitz. I know nothing of Edith and the children. And then I learn Edith died in Birkenau of grief, hunger, exhaustion. In winter of 45, typhus breaks out in Bergen-Belsen, killing thousands of prisoners, among them Margot. Anna's friend Honnelly sees Anna through the barbed wire, naked, her head shaved, covered with lice. I don't have anyone anymore, she weeps. A few days later, Anna dies. My daughter's body is dumped into mass graves just days before the camp is liberated.